Hello everyone, good morning. Uh, welcome back to our uh, Sabbath School uh, presentation discussion uh, for uh, July 23, 2022, uh, lesson number four. Uh, we are now in the series uh, four of uh, the subject uh, about the suffering. And so uh, we are going to deal today about the subject of purification, uh, seeing the goat's pet's face. So, but before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. The Lord today, thank you again for this uh, opportunity that uh, you are able to allow us to present this uh, subject uh, in the Sabbath school lesson. And as we discuss the details, Lord, uh, help us uh, to understand uh, what's the purpose and why we are here to talk about this subject today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so gold, seeing the goldsmith's face, uh, uh, we are going to deal with the subject in his image, uh, faith amid the refining fire, Jesus' last words, and the wise, and the character and community. Uh, so, uh, in, and this is our critics said, and we all who with unbent faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So our discussion for today is about how are we transformed into the image of Jesus? Is there anything we should do in this process? And so that's our some topics that we're going to deal with. Reflecting the image of God, and of course being like gold, and, uh, and the result would be developing our character, victory in conflict, and also our support, the community. And so uh, basically what we're going to deal today is about character uh, development. And uh, in this slide here, uh, we're going to talk about theodicy is the technical term given to the field of study of concerned uh, of study concerned with God and human suffering. If God is both good and infinitely powerful, how can you explain all the suffering in this world? And there are seven major theodicies or approaches to this question. These seven are entitled the perfect plan, the second one the free will, the third one soul making, the fourth one is cosmic conflict, and the fifth one, openness of God, the sixth, uh, the finite God, and the seventh, protest and, and the protests. And so, theodicies. This particular lesson, of course, focuses on soul making theodicy. This theodicy suggests that the best way to explain the existence of suffering in the context of good and powerful God is that God use his suffering to teach us, to refine us, to make us better persons. And uh, the, your question is, do you find that explanation helpful? And what do you think are some of the strengths and weaknesses of such explanation? And so that's why we are going to deal with it today in our uh, key text, uh, as I've said already, but we all with unveiled faces beholding us in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So this week's lesson focuses on the crucible of purification. Purification requires a standard. In our case, a standard is the image of God in us and the image of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect reflection of the image as found in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Purification also requires an agent of purification, which the Bible often uh, presents as fire. Uh, the result of purification is seen in our character, represented by the oil of the lambs of the ten virgins in the parable of Jesus. And the book of Daniel also describes the character of those purified as wise in things of God in the end time, and of course, uh, uh, the idea of Paul's uh, discussion here in our key text about the end 
from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So in our Sunday's lesson, uh, Sunday is in His image. Romans 8, 29, uh, what role does the image of God play in the cosmic conflict? I read it in uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And in Hebrews 2, chapter 5 to 9, why is the image of God so important to him? It says there in Hebrews chapter 2, 5 to 9, it says, It is not to angels as he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking, but there is a place where someone has testified, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? A son of man that you are cared for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and but and put everything under their feet. In putting everything under them, God left nothing that is not subject to them. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to them, but we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might we might he might taste death for everyone. So uh, in his image, uh, reflecting the character of Jesus is important because it is the focus of God's eternal plan for us. And so of course, uh, as noted in early text, uh, the plan of salvation is not a scheme that merely focuses on how to get out of our sinful situation and into a happier place. God's intention from the very beginning was to restore his character in us. Paul sets out his purpose clearly in his letter to the Romans. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that we might be in the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. In Romans 8.24, as a servant of God, the apostles shared the Lord's burning desire to see the divine image restored in those he served. And he rather colorfully told the Galatians, my dear children, for whom I am again the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Galatians 4.19. The process of reflecting the glory of God is both important and continuous as Paul noticed. And we all, in, in 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, We all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory from which comes the Lord and who is the Spirit. So reflecting God's image is very important in the end time. For whom He for you? That's 8.29, Romans 8.29. That the image of the Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren, conform to the image of God. He predestined us to conform to the image of God. And so restoration, there, because we lost the image of God when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. But we were created in His image. And yet when Adam and Eve sinned, we lost it. So in the beginning, God created humankind in His image. Genesis 1.27 However, sin has been disfiguring that image in humans for centuries since, uh, you know, Adam and Eve uh, committed sin. And of course, uh, uh, this is one of the goals of the gospel is to restore God's image in us, to be made to the image of His Son, Romans 8, 29. And so we live amidst the cosmic conflict, the whole universe and all heavenly beings are looking. We should see the reflection of the character of Jesus in us. That's why the author of Alison, uh, you know, entitled uh, "Reflecting," or it says, uh, uh, "Reflecting the image of you know the, the blacksmith's face." Uh, seeing the blacksmith's face is found in, in our subject today because we should see the reflection of the character of Jesus in us. So, how are we going to deal with this? And so, uh, faith amid the refining fire, uh, we have discussed about Paul's context of the image of God, 
now personally experienced Job uh, uh, has also experienced this and uh, we are going to deal this morning and also next week about the subject of the experience of Job but today we are going to talk about Job 23 verses 1 to 10 the question is what is the essence of Job's struggle what does he not see at the same time what does he take on faith despite all the trials he experiences and in your experience how do trials refine and purify us can you think of other ways we could be refined without having to go through suffering and so uh, uh, let's read the text here because uh, Job 23 verses 1 to 10 then Job replied even today my complaint is bitter his hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him. If only I could go to his dwelling. I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would, would he vigorously oppose me? No, he would not press charges against me. Their upright can establish their innocence before him, and there I would be delivered forever from my judge. But I go to the east, he is not there. I go to the west, I do not find him. And so, you know, in Job's situation, uh, he, 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 he suffered in the absence of God. Uh, I mean to say that he doesn't find God in his suffering. And so he said, I go to the east, he is not there. I go to the west, I do not find him. So God, uh, Job is searching for, uh, for God in, in his trials and in his suffering. And yet he cannot find God here. And say, yet, but in verse 9, and when he is at work in the north, I do not see him. And when he turns to south, I catch no glimpse of him. Now, those are the... Job's, uh, you know, perceptions uh, in his suffering that he cannot find God anywhere, east, west, north, south, anywhere he cannot find it. But in verse 10 it says, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Wow. And see, in, in this context, you know, uh, very interesting that it is one thing to be in a battle it's another not even to see the forces arrayed in that battle uh, in a sense that is this is what the christians what the christians deal with we know that the forces are out there we can feel them in our lives and yet we have to press ahead in faith and trusting who is invisible and from the beginning satan has claimed that the way God behaves is unfair and unjust. And even since Satan and his angels rebelled against God and had to expel, be expelled from heaven, the Lord has allowed plenty of time, opportunity for the devil to reveal his character. And in the beginning, it was not clear to many in the universe what Satan was really like. But it slowly began to show through his actions and by the people he decided to follow. Likewise, those who chose God began to demonstrate his character. And one of the example is Job. The author of Job described how under pressure he was faithful in verse 10 here of chapter 23. But as he knows the way that I take, when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. And look for example in the first two chapters of Job, and if you wonder how many attempts uh, in the book of Daniel where it says hundreds of millions being watched in the courtrooms, note now note that how God resolved questions, particularly in the charges of Satan that are leveled against him and against his friends before the heavenly court. In one book of Job, Satan accused God and he accused Job of being unworthy of God's trust. Did God say that that's a lie, Satan? That is, this man is perfect? 
God said, you have raised a serious question. The only way to answer is to show you. And he uh, looked at the rest of the book of Job. Did Job show himself to be untrustworthy? I mean, trustworthy friend of God? Did he trust God because he was being richly rewarded? Or did he seem to be utterly abandoned and yet he still trusted God? And, uh, you know, uh, the book ends with God saying, Thank you, Job, for you have said what, uh, what, uh, to me of what is right. And Job was a friend of all the way through. And God could then turn to heavenly court and say, Do you need any more evidence about the falsity of Satan's charges and trustworthiness of my friend Job? And this is God's way. God himself has been accused. He does not merely deny the accusation. He says, let me show you. My children, let me show you the falsity of this accusation and the truth about myself and you decide. Imagine the humility of the infinite one submitting his character and government to the scrutiny and investigation of mere creatures. But that's God's way of doing it. It is the only way to really establish love and trust in the fullest sense of the freedom. And I believe that people who remain faithful under the pressure are the most convincing evidence that God is good and fair and righteous. Though Job did not understand many things about his sufferings, he did have one good conviction when he tested when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold in verse 10. But I wonder whether the patron grasped the implication of his loyalty that by his patient endurance, he vindicated his own character and thus the character of him whose representative he was. So being proven to be gold seems to be an incentive for Job here, something to fix his eyes upon, and that helps pull him through his troubles. It's a powerful testimony to his character already that amid all the pain and suffering, he was able to sense the reality of the purifying process. Also, however, much he didn't understand, he knew that these trials would refine him. And so that's why it says reflecting the character of Jesus is important because it provides vindication of God's honor to the universe. And that's what Job said, did, I mean. And uh, not only what he said, but what he did. He trusted God. Reflecting the character of God is important because it provides the vindication of God's honor to the universe. So, uh, being like gold, uh, fourth as gold in Job, Job 23 and God affirmed that Job was a blameless and upright man. Then the enemy showed doubts by questioning Job's motivation. And yet, Job was on the brink of desperation. He couldn't understand why all these tragedies were happening. But he understood that he was being tested. He was sure that the process would make him shine like gold eventually and that he would be perfected. And so uh, our true character is shown in the most difficult trials and it's refined by them. In those critical moments, God improves aspects of our character and wouldn't be visible otherwise. Wow. So uh, in this uh, justice lesson, Jesus' last word. Now we are going to deal with Matthew 25. Uh, there are three parables in this chapter. And so what do you think the oil represents in this parable? In one reads the oil as the Holy Spirit or as the character the wake of the waiting ones. How does the story read differently? How does the parable in the builders, uh, uh, you know, uh, Matthew 7, 24 to 27, clarify the question? And in Matthew 31 to 46, on what basis does this king separate the sheep from the goats? 
And what implication does this have for the meaning of an oil in the early parable and what is character about? So uh, uh, there are a lot of verses, 46 verses, but I want to go through here. Uh, at the time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took the lambs, went out to meet the bridegroom. I just would like to uh, have the chest. And then uh, there are five uh, have, and the ten virgins, five have enough oil, and five didn't have enough oil. And during the night, uh, the five virgins, the, the foolish virgins, uh, they ran out of oil and they asked for more and oil lamps and they replied they will not enough for both of us you instead go to those who sell oil buy some for yourselves but while they were on their way to buy the oil the bridegroom arrived the virgins who already went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut later the others came Lord Lord they said open the door for us but he replied truly I tell you I don't know you so uh, the, the story is that the Son of Man uh, comes in His glory and all the angels with Him. He will sit in His glorious throne. All the nations will be guarded before Him and He will separate the one from another. Shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put, he will put the sheep on His right hand and, uh, and, and the goats on the left. Then the King will say, Those who are the right hand, you are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. And then he said, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. And I was stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you and thirsty and give you something to drink? And then when they did say to the stranger and invite you in, or did they clothes and clothe you? When did they see you sick or in prison and go to prison? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whenever you did it for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And so the story is uh, on and on. We see the connection between the end of time and character emphasized in Jesus' last word before he dies. In Matthew 25, he tells his disciples the parables about the ten virgins, the talents and the sheep and the goats. All three parables describe how we are to live in the time before Jesus returns. In the first one, the five foolish virgins don't, have, don't take extra supplies of oil with them as they wait for the bridegroom. And they beg uh, for extra oil but have refused as the five go out and search for more the bridegroom arrives and close the door and in the return they bang the door about the hair the bridegroom words truly i tell you i don't know you and we often interpret uh, the oil as representing the holy spirit and those without the holy spirit will not be taken to heaven when Jesus returns. And Ellen White uh, makes a specific applications of the story. And so uh, here in this PowerPoint here, reflecting the character is important because it is the focus of the remnant. And so uh, uh, the story is, uh, Ellen White said, in your instruct of January 16, 1896, page 2, in the parable, the foolish virgins were represented as begging for oils and failing to receive it at the requests. This is symbolic of those who have not prepared themselves by developing a character to stand in a time of crisis. It is as if they should go to their neighbors and say, Give me your character or I shall be lost. Those that were wise could not impart their oil to the flickering lamps of the foolish virgins. Character is not transferable. It is not to be bought or sold. It is to be acquired. The Lord has given to every individual an opportunity to obtain a righteous character 
through the hours of probation, but he was not provided a way by which one human and agent may impart to another the character which he has developed by going through hard experiences, by learning lessons from the great teacher, so that he can manifest patience under trial and exercise faith so he can remove mountains of impossibility. And so as we say in this here, reflecting the character is important because it is the focus of the remnant. And so that's what happened towards the end of time. Uh, when we have the character developed in us, we would be ready. The same thing in our applications today. And without the Holy Spirit, uh, the character cannot be developed. So the wise answered saying, Let's know there should not be enough for us and you, but you gather to those who sell and buy to yourselves. The difference between the two groups of virgins were supply of oil. The first meaning the oil is the Holy Spirit, but it could also be interpreted as the character. And of course, uh, if you merge them together, the Holy Spirit making you change your, your attitudes and developing the character, because without the Holy Spirit, we cannot really reflect the character of Jesus Christ. In the parable of the foolish virgins, the foolish virgins are represented as be begging for oil, failing to receive at the request that's symbolic of those who have not prepared themselves by developing a character to stand in time of crisis. We will be victorious in conflict if we develop our character through a close relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus affirmed that our character is shown in the way we treat others. Just like uh, Matthew, the parable says that uh, you have done it to me, you have done it to the list of these brothers and sisters, you have done it to me. So uh, and that, those are the characters of people towards the end of time before Jesus Christ come. And so uh, we need to be aware of those. It says the conflict of earth in the providence of God's of God furnished very training necessary to develop characters fit for the courts of heaven. We are to become members of the royal family, the sons of God, and all things work together for good to those who love God and submit themselves to his will. Our high calling, November 6. So in our Wednesday's lesson, the wise. Now talking about Daniel again in Daniel 12, 1 to 3, and talking about the end time prophecy. Uh, what time in history it is referring to? What does this passage have to say about the character of God's people during the time? How are they distinguished from the wicked of this world? When it says that the wise will understand what is that they, they will understand? What can we learn for today from the Bible's portrayal of the end time situation? So let's read the text here in Daniel chapter 12, 1 to 3 and verse 10. It says, At the time Michael, great, the great prince who protects our people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as that will happen from the beginning of nations until then. If you notice this, at the end of time, there will be distress such as has not happened from the beginning until then. By a time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and other shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness, like the stars, forever and ever. And in verse 10, many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are, who are, who are wise will understand. The question here in our text is that, what can we, you know, what is, what, when it says that the wise will understand, what is it, what is it that they will understand? 
what is it that they will understand. We will understand that the end of time is coming and there will be difficult times. And we are going to be prepared for that. Because, you know, uh, when Jesus' people is ready, they have to go through this difficult, so-called Jacob's trouble, where everybody is going to undergo difficult times, especially uh, towards the end of, uh, before, just before the coming of Jesus Christ. And those who are wise will understand. We will understand that uh, only those righteous are going to be saved and uh, those wicked, none of the wicked will understand. They won't, they won't understand because they are, they are not prepared for it. And so it says many will be purified, made spotless and refined. And when we go through this, this purification process to become spotless and refined, we will understand the purpose is to, to you know, the purpose is uh, according to this, reflecting the character of Jesus is important because it provides a compelling counter-cultural witness to the world. Meaning to say that at the end of time, when we develop a character in the image of God, uh, this is now the so-called compelling counter-cultural witness to the world. That there are people who follow God and has been reflecting the image of him. Who created him? Because they believe in Jesus, the creator and also a savior. Very important in the context and that's why they will understand. They will understand that suffering is important in the development of a character. So, you know, very uh, uh, interesting to note that uh, in this process, we can see that uh, end of time is very important in our lesson today. So uh, let me uh, uh, otherwise hear a note that uh, the subject we look at in this subject here is that the idea of uh, suffering in the context of this compelling countercultural witness to the world is that <clears throat> victory and conflict, many shall be purified. And then, of course, uh, Daniel and Revelation, we see that humankind will be divided into groups in the end time. The pure, the wicked, and those who understand, and those who don't. In Matthew 25, uh, the, the goats is separated from the sheep. The sheep to the right and the goats to the left. And those who are to the right will, you know, be ushered into the kingdom. Right here in Daniel also, the, uh, the wise will understand those who are purified, those who are, you know, uh, uh, made white or refined. According to Jeremiah, the time will be the time of Jacob's trouble. Once the time of grace ends, the redeemed will have reached final victory and will be refined and purified. Meanwhile, the wicked will persist in the rebellion against God. Wow. And so uh, that's why we have the countercultural, compelling evidence uh, to the world about the end time. <clears throat> in our first lesson, character and community, Paul now is going to emphasize a very important concept that character development is not only reflected on the individual, but also on the community, the church. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16, what metaphor the church does Paul use here? What role do the spiritual gifts play in the church? Why is this important at the end of time? In what way is the witness of a community more powerful than an individual. What are the implications of this cosmic conflict? Let's read the text here. Ephesians chapter 4, 11 to 16. It says here, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip, to equip his people for works of service 
so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach until the unity of faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God to become mature, attaining to the whole mysteries of the fullness of God. If you notice here, it is not only the individual that becomes mature, but also the church being equipped, uh, you know, with, that, with, with all the gifts that God has given. Then we will no longer be in fans tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here, there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitfulness, skip, deceitful scheming. Instead of speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become a very, you know, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself in love, such as part does it work, it work. So here, uh, Paul now is uh, uh, developing his uh, uh, thinking about not only individual developing a character in the image of God, uh, he is also implying the very basic concept that individuals who are part of the community become now you know, a reflection of, uh, of, of that image that is being developed by an individual. It is one thing to be a godly individual and quite another thing altogether to be godly in community. And the most complaining evidence of the truth is that the Father is good and fair and righteous of course when a group of people who may not share anything naturally in common and would often uh, you know, get on each other's nerves, comes together in a loving unity that can be attributed to nothing else but the goodness and the power of God. I think uh, I could remember uh, quotations from the Book of Education by Ellen White says that uh, the, the most compelling evidence to the community is the loving and lovable people. This is the church. And so Paul emphasizes reflecting the character of Jesus in a community in his letter to the Ephesians. He highlights the fact that reaching the fullness of Christ is what church body does, a project, a project together with all the spiritual gift being focused on one ultimate goal. Uh, so Christ himself gave the apostles, you know, in verse 11, and, uh, you know, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service and uh, so that the body of Christ may be built up, that is building a muscle, is uniting together. And it says here that until we all reach unity and faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and becoming mature, attaining the whole mysteries of the fullness of God. As Paul has just showed us, Jesus is coming to collect his body not just the assemblage of disconnected body parts. Our community, the church, must also have Christ's character embedded deep within. Then we will be authentic when the rest of the world is falling apart. How else can you explain such wide variety of people holding together in love other by the supernatural power of self? So reflecting, reflecting the character of Jesus is important because it is God's highest ambition for our church community. And so uh, community is very important in God's economy. And so uh, we, till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the mission of the stature, of the fullness of Christ. Wow. Obviously, developing our character is an individual work. However, what about the character of the community? Can the church develop and perfect its character? And so, the character of the church is the sum collaboration of every member of the character. This character is refined when we work together to help others. This is also powerful testimony for all heavenly beings. And so, uh, 
His intent was that thou that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. In verse 10 of chapter 3. So it is not only the reflecting uh, or, or uh, you know collaborations of of displaying God's character in this world. His also intent is to show the universe, the heavenly realms, about God's people has a community in this world, in this earth, that reflects his character. Wow. Interesting concept. Now, I have a few slides here that's uh, some quotations and then we are going to summarize our discussion today. Uh, Ellen White, uh, in the upward of August 26, it says, When trials come to us, let us not dwell upon the greatness of the difficulties and feel that we cannot have joy in the Lord. It is true we will have changes of feelings. There will come at times uh, of discouragement and depression. But shall we live by feeling or by faith? When our brethren and friends speak and advisely and cause us, let us not be cast down. Let us remember that we are in the world of trials and grief, of sorrows and disappointment. When these experiences come to us, this will drive us to Christ. If they do not, we meet with loss. Now, I need to be uh, transparent here. In many instances, God would like us to go trials and temptations to get better. I mean, better. But there are also cases that we become bitter. We become disappointed. Uh, we, we are refined, but on the other hand, there are people who, uh, who, who really, you know, just depressed, bitter because of what's going on with it. And that is, uh, a, you know, because if we do not, we meet with loss. And when we experience this come to us, this should drive us to Christ. Because if we don't go, to Jesus Christ, we become bitter, and we have our own picture of who God is. And so, uh, another slide says, character building, and uh, is the most important tool ever entrusted to human beings. And never before was its diligent study so important as now. Never was in any previous generation called to meet issues so momentous. Never before young men and young women confronted by parents so great to confront them today. Uh, education page 225. So that is our lesson discussion today. Uh, so let's have a summary here. Seeing the goldsmith's face, uh, we all have been corrupted by sin. Yet God's desire is to restore us. That is really uh, uh, the, the purpose. Uh, God would like to restore the image. God can use these trials to refine you, purify you, and bring out His image in your character. And I hopefully that they will, you know, uh, adhere to this because character development is important in the plan of salvation. Important in the plan of salvation. Because the righteous allow times of trouble to purify and refine them. But there are people who are going to be bitter because, you know, they don't accept the reality of what's going on. And so we experience and reveal the fullness of Christ when we are working together in fellowship with each other as a community. And so that is really uh, the gist of our discussion today that we are not only going to develop as an individual to mature, but we are, we become part and part portion of the community. We go to church that would reflect the image of God to the community, not only to the community, 
but the whole universe and heavenly realm. Wow. So thank you again for uh, uh, viewing this lesson. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Lord, today, uh, thank you again for the lesson that uh, you have given us. Important subject that we will be able to learn more about character development. Very important as we face the end time of our lives. End times because time of trouble comes. And it be that we will always trust in you. That we can develop the individually to mature and become part of that community that is also mature to reflect your image in Jesus Christ. 